And uh, my name is Pat Murray. I'm the, I've been the coordinator for A Better Cleveland for All, um, which is, um, I'll tell you a bit about it in a minute. Um, welcome to this first of uh, two meeting greets for uh, candidates for uh, city council uh, in the city of Cleveland, who um, A Better Cleveland for All is supporting this year. Um, uh, Better Cleveland for All is made up of um, uh, some CCPC members who've been working to uh, increase the number of progressive candidates for Cleveland City Council in this election and improve their chances for, uh, for, for winning uh, a seat on City Council. Um, tonight we have three candidates um, who will each uh, have five minutes to introduce themselves um, and tell you about the issues that are important to them. And, um, and then finally, to, to let you know how you uh, uh, could, could help with their campaign if you, so, if you feel so inclined uh, over the next 68 days for those who have a primary and over the next uh, uh, about 100, uh, 120 days, I guess, if, uh, if, they, if, it goes on, if they go on to the general election. Um, at the end of the question and answer period, um, we will. Uh, that they'll have a, a minute and a half for closing statements. So in between their opening statements uh, and the closing, it's, which will be about 7.55, we will, um, uh, we will um, be taking questions from the chat uh, for, for, from, from all of you. So if you have a question that you'd like to pose to the candidates, uh, just type it in the chat and then I'll pose it to them. Um, and. Um, They'll have about a minute to respond to each question um, that, that people raise. So, um, um, with that, the, the order, uh, no, no particular um, special order, but uh, we're going to go in tonight. It'll be Kate Warren, uh, Eric Walker, and then uh, Ayat Amin. Uh, so, um, without further ado, let me just briefly introduce Kate. Kate is a research, is, is on leave. But she's a research fellowship fellow at the Centers for Community Solutions here in Cleveland, and she's a candidate uh, in Ward uh, 13 for City Council. So, Kate, without further ado, why don't you take it? Thanks, Pat, and thanks, Deb, for organizing this tonight. Um, and thank you to those of you who are here. I am so glad that you uh, still want to spend the evening on Zoom and hear from candidates, and I'm thankful for the way that you're leading in and getting to know your city council candidates this year. It's a really important municipal election year. Um, so I would love to share a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Kate Warren. I am running for city council in Ward 13 of Cleveland, which is uh, covers most of the old Brooklyn neighborhood of Cleveland and a sliver of the Stockyards neighborhood of Cleveland. Um, I've lived here in this neighborhood for a little over a decade and have been really involved in the community both in working with the Old Brooklyn CDC and doing community work and doing get out the vote work and even just neighboring. Um, but my background is actually in social services. So I, I started out after, after college at Cleveland State um, working at the city mission where I served men, women, and children who were experiencing homelessness and, excuse me. <laughs> and, um, I really learned a lot during that time about some of the really deep systemic issues that were facing Cleveland. Issues like housing affordability, poverty, uh, systemic racism, things that were happening on the ground for those Clevelanders who were experiencing homelessness. And what I was struck by is how much it felt like we in direct service were just sort of passing out band-aids when there was um, really a gaping wound in the community, really um, just deep structural problems that I was interested in, in tackling. And so that led me to go get my master's degree in public administration. And, um, and from there, I landed at the Center for Community Solutions, where I've been doing research and policy work over the last seven years. Um, and most of my research has focused on what we can do as a community, um, both from a policy perspective and from a, a direct service perspective to address the root issues of poverty, to address um, the, the systemic problems that are facing our community. And so that's why I am running for city council because I believe we can make 
really meaningful policy change in our local government that can get at some of those issues. So to share a little bit about my overarching priorities, I think um, when I'm elected to city council, the first big priority is going to be to provide quality city services for residents. It's the number one thing that I'm hearing about from folks as I'm canvassing is issues like um, potholes getting filled and trash getting picked up and recycling being recycled and sort of the bread and butter of city services. But I think the reality from what I'm hearing from residents is that um, the system that is providing those city services is is broken and that we if, if we don't if we don't fix those systems that are broken, then council people are going to be spinning our wheels for a long time trying to address those issues and not be able to get at what are those deeper issues. So I'm really interested in getting in the trenches with departments at City Hall and, and seeing what needs to be done to, to, to resolve some of those issues so that we can work on, on deeper public policy issues with city with city council. And so for me, some of those priorities are um, focus on reducing poverty. I think as a city, unless we um, look for solutions to make sure that residents have access to jobs that pay a living wage, whether that's by making sure that those jobs are accessible via public transit, or whether that's by working to attract businesses to Cleveland that are going to pay a living wage and holding them to that. Um, until we work on reducing our poverty rate, because we are the highest poverty big city in the country, um, all of our other work is, is going to be a bigger challenge because we need to increase our tax base, we need to um, we need to raise the standard of living for Clevelanders. That's at the heart of everything that um, that we will do as a city is to work on reducing our poverty rate. Um, and my other priorities are to improve public health. I believe health and um, economics go right hand in hand that um, if we don't have a healthy population that that population is not able to work and earn money in the same way and, and that those things play off of each other and are intertwined. Um, and finally, a priority of mine is to increase government transparency. I think we have seen obviously a big push and many of you are a part of it to increase opportunities for participation in government in Cleveland um, through public comment. And I would say we need to take that even a step further and look at ways that City Hall can be proactive in the way that we are communicating things to residents and be very transparent about what we're doing at City Council and, and what's happening at our city government. Um, and from a, a data and research perspective and the current work that I do, um, you seconds. know, it is hard to get information out of the city. And so I will, um, I will fight for that increased transparency. Thanks, Deb. Um, th thanks, Kate, for, for, for those remarks. Um, uh, next, uh, I want to introduce Eric Walker. Um, Eric is a candidate for city council in a very crowded race in, in Ward 4, um, where uh, Ken Johnson is sort of the quasi incumbent. Um, Eric um, works in the Cleveland Public Library, has worked there for many years, um, and has been an activist in that community. So, um, Eric, uh, why don't you take it from there? Hey, Fred, and uh, again, thanks, Deb, for organizing this event. <clears throat> um, and thank you guys for, for being here today. Uh, yes, my, my name is Eric Walker. Um, I am a resident here in Ward 4. Um, I have lived in Ward 4. I actually grew up in Ward 4. I'm living in the house since, that, uh, since I I'm, was 12 years old. My mother and my sister bought a house. Here on, on 148th and Kinsman, where I grew up at, and um, in 2017, she passed away. And I moved back to the home that I grew up in. I've, I've always lived in a ward just prior to moving back home. I lived, um, if anybody knows, Shaker Square and where Dewey's um, coffee shop used to be is now Bigsby's. I lived right across the street there for about 13 years. So I've been in the ward for, for many, many, many years. Um, and <clears throat> growing up here, I, I, you know, this neighborhood was a, 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 a vibrant neighborhood where neighbors were able to talk to one another, where we saw um, beautiful um, housing and where we saw business thriving. And since then there has, um, with the with the current um, 
or suspended council person, um, those things have vanished. Um, and it's very concerning to me. And so I decided um, to run and to bring back transparency in our government, like Kate says, and to bring back honesty and integrity back, back to, to the office. Um, one of my priorities um, that I think is very important here in Ward 4, we've got to increase the voting participation in Ward 4. Why I say increase the voting participation, it's because the, if we increase voting participation here in Ward 4, we get noticed downtown and city hall from the mayor's office. And so those things and those resources that our ward desperately needs, we will have the ability to access those. I always reference <clears throat> Ward 1, which is a, 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 one of the uh, highest voting um, wards on, this, on the east side. And we see um, from them that they've obtained um, brand new schools. They've just built a, a John F. Kennedy High School, a brand new one along with the rec center, a brand new one. Whitney Young, K through um, eight, a brand new edifice. And uh, Jameson, um, a brand new, new school that's been there for maybe about five to 10 years. So those are just some of the examples why we need to, to, to increase our voter, voter participation. So the other thing is, um, like Kate <laughs> said again, is to tackle poverty. And um, referencing the community for uh, the Center for Community Solutions, Kate, um, it, it, in Ward 4, the poverty rate is here is 60%. That's, that's, that's concerning. We, we have to come up with some solutions to, to, to com combat that. And one of the solutions I believe is um, bringing some type of school such as Max Hayes that, um, deals with um, bringing our children, our young people, our men, our women into trades and knowing how to build and knowing how to, how to, to, to fix um, those things that are going to be, that are going to need fixing. You know, we're, we're, we're trying, our country is trying to go into, to a green type of um, organization where we rely less on um, fossil fuels and more on solar power and, and wind power. And there's gonna be a need for people to fix those things. And I'm, I'm very, very passionate that we bring those, those type of jobs to, to this community. Um, what that would do, it would enhance um, those skills with our young men and our young women, as well as they can go on and, and, and build, build businesses, um, for them and their families. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Those are just some of the things that that that's concerning me. Um, as well as we we you know, since I was 12 years old, this war has been Ooh, under the second. this war has been under the leadership of Kim Johnson, and I think it's time that we bring somebody here that's going to bring the war together. We have. Thank, thanks, Derek. I uh, appreciate your comments. And uh, um, we have a, I, I just want to remind people uh, to uh, begin to populate um, the chat with some questions for the candidates, or else uh, it's going to be a, a, a kind of a monologue here. Uh, so if you, have, if you have thoughts or questions for the candidates, please put them in the chat. Um, and then um, our, the last candidate. Um, uh, is uh, Ayat Amin. Um, Ayat Amin is a city council candidate in Ward 3, uh, she, uh, where she lives. And uh, she, she presently works in economic development in the private sector in Cleveland. So um, go ahead, Ayat. Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, I would like to reiterate, thank you all for showing up at 7 p.m. on a um, Thursday evening, I believe it is Thursday. I very much appreciate it. Um, so as I said, my name is Ayat Amin and I'm running for city council in Ward 3, which is Ohio City, Tremont, um, downtown and part of the stockyards as an environmentalist. So 
I've been an environmentalist my whole life. Anything an individual can do for the environment, I've done it. I uh, don't have a car. I ride a blue bike with a big blue basket. The basket's pretty noticeable. I um, have been vegan and vegetarian for almost 10 years now. Um, I used to live zero waste, which is where you don't give anything to a landfill, um, but now I give some things to a landfill. Um, and I've been politically involved in the environmental movement. Um, two years ago, actually, I attended Cleveland's climate protest, holding a sign saying, change the politics, not the climate. Um, many people don't realize the daily injustices we face by living through a polluted environment and how Cleveland is facing a real environmental crisis. Um, here are three very concrete reasons why. One, we have lead pollution just as bad as Flint, but we're not allocating the funding to solve it. Two, Cleveland is the sixth worst city in the US for asthma and allergies, and we got worse in the past decade with those rankings. And third, I really hope you all believe in climate change by this time, but if you do believe in climate change, we are, Cleveland is third in the US, third in the US for emissions per capita, which means we use a lot more energy than a city of our size should be. Not only is that bad for the planet, but it's expensive for businesses and for residents. Um, to, in talking to residents in the ward, a lot of them bring not only how rising the tax abatement has made um, property taxes and rents higher, but also how utilities are rising for water and for energy. And it's our city's job, city council and the mayor's job to really make sure that we're getting good rates for those. Um, as I said, I went to that protest two years ago and nothing had changed and um, nothing has changed since then. But even after that, no one, no politician, this election was even talking about it. Um, if you um, listen to scientists, um, they say we have by 2030, less than a decade to actually get our act together on all these issues. And I could not watch another election go by where the issue isn't even talked about. So this is what motivated me to run. And um, what am I gonna do about it? Well, I, I hope you all know about the Green New Deal. Um, I have written a Cleveland version called the Cleveland Green Deal. So this plan is, for, is Cleveland specific. Um, and it's a set of 10 policies that we can do in the next four years that would radically improve um, our future, not just in terms of the climate and pollution, but also in terms of poverty and um, income inequality. Um, so as I said, there's 10 policies in five areas, um, cleaning up water pollution, um, air quality um, through parks and public spaces, um, energy generation, uh, uh, building efficiency and the last one is funding public transport um, so those are the five areas there's two policies in each area um, and if I were elected into council I would want to really advocate um, for getting the Cleveland Green Deal passed um, I thank you all for your time and look forward to your questions Thanks, Ayat. Um, appreciate your, your time and, uh, and, your, and your comments. Um, um, so uh, we, we have some questions in the chat at this point, and I'll sort of pose them, and hopefully we'll get through most of them. But uh, there's three so far, so uh, we have room for some more. Um, uh, the first question river, uh, reflects the question of uh, the, the uptick in crime that's been uh, and, and shootings uh, in, the, in, in, the, in Cleveland. Um, Really across the city, but this was specifically addresses Ward Three. Uh, what plans do each of you have um, on how to address that? And uh, we'll, we'll we'll start with uh, we'll, we'll start with Kate, and we'll sort of rotate who goes first. Um, Kate. Thanks. I appreciate the question, and um, and definitely violent crime is on the minds of my neighbors as well. We. Um, we had some carjackings here in Old Brooklyn, and in fact, on, uh, on Christmas Eve, my neighbor two doors down had his car stolen at gunpoint. And so, um, you know, that hit very close to home for me and my neighbors and uh, is obviously very troubling. Um, 
my uh, my opinion, which I believe is backed up by research, is that crime is often a symptom of deeper problems. And so when we're seeing these violent crimes happening around the city, um, it's often young people who are committing them, um, not always, but often. And we're talking about a time when our economy is struggling, when people are not having access to opportunities to um, to fill their time. And so I think um, giving young people opportunities to have meaningful employment, sorry, um, and, and to, to be engaged in that way can help reduce uh, some of these, these deeper problems. Uh, Eric, do you want to take a crack at that question? So, and, <clears throat> I believe uh, a, a, a lot um, with this is is contributing to to this issue. But what are we going to do um, in the short term? So in the short term, I, I I think we need to advocate for you know we used to have at least when I was growing up we had many stations here um, throughout throughout the city where police were um, were placed in these many many stations and that um, uh, uh, you could call on those um, officers that were there to, to come in and tackle problems. So I, I believe bringing back the mini stations as well as having um, police maybe utilize bicycles to kind of ride around throughout the neighborhood um, uh, to, to start tackling that. There's a big, bigger issue to this as well, like um, poverty. Poverty contributes to the crime. And I think we really have to tackle um, that issue. We're, we're, somehow we've, we've got to start. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, Ayat, do you want to have a crack at this question? Um, yeah, I, um, I think Kate and Eric have already addressed a lot of what I was already going to say. I think it's very, um, simplistic to, I think oftentimes when there's an uptick in crime, the simplistic answer is let's fund more police, but um, more police does not always mean better public safety. Um, and what we're really looking at is what are solutions that will get us better public safety. Um, and I think we have to look at that from two angles. The first is really addressing the root causes of crime. Um, both Eric and Kate said it, it's poverty um, amongst other issues. Um, so really making sure that we're looking holistically at addressing um, poverty in the city. And then secondly, also looking for uh, methods of um, policing that make the community feel safe, um, such as community uh, policing that has been advocated by um, many neighborhoods in Cleveland. Um, ten okay. Thanks, Sayat. Um, we're gonna uh, uh, just, I'm gonna just empirically decide to give people a little bit more time to answer each question. So we're gonna change it to one and a, one and a half minutes. One minute doesn't seem to quite get people up to speed. Uh, sorry about that. Um, um, the second question has to do with housing, uh, it's in the chat. Um, there's been a decline in housing stock. There's been an increase in vacant properties and the lack of affordable housing. Um, what would be your plans to address this? Um, and we're gonna start with Eric this time, okay? So War Fort um, has an abundance of vacant lots and um, a lot of uh, vacant buildings and things of, of that nature. One of the things that um, uh, I, I, I will um, look into um, is Habitat for Humanity. We've seen it um, in Ward 6 where um, they have come and they've built houses um, on these vacant lots for and, and affordable housing um, for, 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 for that ward. And so that is just one avenue I, I think would be um, um, an idea to, to look at to, to see if we could uh, use these vacant lots to have um, habitat, habitat for Humanity to come in and build, build houses on. So um, that's just one idea 
that I have. Okay. Um, Ayat, you're, you're up next on this question. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great question. Um, so as Pat introduced earlier, I've worked in economic de development at a national level, um, which means a part of my job right now is talking to other cities um, and seeing what their challenges are. And this is a challenge that comes up time and time again. Um, and I think one thing that's been consistent on how other cities such as St. Louis or Atlanta are addressing this same problem um, is that there's a difference. Um, there is vacant land in in our city, but who has access to it is not always equal. And I would really love to see more avenues for um, residents to get access to that vacant loan, that those vacant that vacant land so they can build their own homes. Um, too often, the path to ownership of that land is made very easy for larger developers, which don't always lead to um, more affordable housing. Um, so if we really um, want to see more affordable housing in our neighborhoods, we really have to de democratize access, um, not just to land itself, but to the process of building um, property in the city. Thanks, Ayat. And uh, Kate, you're next. Thanks. Um, you know, I think I, I want to just acknowledge that um, the issue of affordable housing and housing affordability looks um, pretty different in different parts of the city, that different wards and different parts of the city are facing different issues when it comes to housing access and safe, affordable housing. Um, here in Old Brooklyn, I think, um, Old Brooklyn is often seen as a neighborhood that is um, more affordable than some of the, the neighborhoods of the city that are that are gentrifying, that people feel like, oh, I can afford to buy a house in Old Brooklyn. It's sort of that middle part of the market. Um, and so I think what's really important is for, for us in Old Brooklyn to um, to put things into place to preserve that affordability and also to make sure that we're taking care of the quality of the housing stock that we have. And I think if we can do those things, that that is really a good thing um, for the city overall, but there are some citywide reforms that I that I would love to see. One is um, I think the city should put in place source of income protections for folks who um, who are on Section 8 so that they can truly um, find housing where they want. The point of a housing choice voucher is that you should be able to choose where you live. And right now, um, so many of those folks face discrimination. Um, which is basically uh, codified racism that it, you know, mostly black and brown folks using those those housing vouchers, not exclusively. Um, but so so those sorts of income protections would be key to, to advancing housing affordability. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, the next question, and this will go to Ayat first, uh, is also about housing. Um, and it's about uh, um, could you address the issue of tax abatement and how the city could better use this tool to improve the situation with housing in the city? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great question. Um, obviously, so the city um, commissioned a consultant who did a report on the tax abatement um, earlier this year. And that report found that there are four neighborhoods in Cleveland where the tax abatement is leading to high levels of displacement. And three of those neighborhoods are in Ward 3. That is um, downtown um, Ohio City and Tremont. Detroit Shoreway was the fourth neighborhood. Um, so I think uh, often, again, part of my day job is talking to developers and I understand their challenges around building in a city like Cleveland. Um, that being said, there are definitely neighborhoods in Cleveland that uh, could still benefit from the tax abatement, but for neighborhoods such as uh, Ward 3, where we're seeing a lot of displacement and a lot of the negative effects of the tax abatement, I think we can um, put more restrictions on use of it. Um, one thing I would really like to see is making sure that we get more of a community benefit out of it, right? If we're going to give such a long-term tax break to these housing projects, let's be sure that we're getting more public spaces, more funding for public transit, more affordable housing as a result of that long-term tax break. Um, in addition, um, as part of my uh, Cleveland Green Deal, um, I would really like to have green rebates or um, 
give a conditional ta uh, tax break if um, a building Thanks, Ayat. Um, Kate, you're next on this question. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I agree with, with a lot of what Ayat said that I think um, the problem with our tax abatement policy in Cleveland is that it has basically been, if you're building something new, you get a tax abatement. And I, and I think that we need to be more strategic as a city about how we're using tax abatements and um, think about what we want to get out of them because ultimately it's, you know, the city that's not getting that revenue then from those taxes uh, when, when they're, when they're building new construction. So I agree that I think we need to focus our tax abatements in areas that may not otherwise see development. And so I think for areas like Ohio City and Tremont, we can say that private development is happening there and it would happen without that tax abatement at this point. And so we need to focus differently. Personally, I would love to see tax abatement that's focused on um, transit oriented development, like what can we do to make sure that development is in places that make sense for folks who want to rely on public transit. It's good for the environment. It's good for job access. Uh, and it would be good for the city and help focus the way that those dollars are invested. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Um, Eric, you're next. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So you know, tax abatement it's it's been a, been an issue for me, um, especially in in a community that um, is impoverished as as Ward Four. And so I, I believe that you know if we're going to have um, developers come into our city into this ward. And we we have we give them tax breaks. They're going to have to promise something um, that's going to benefit um, the, the 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 residents um, within the ward. Um, taking money and 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 that money that could be used for for like everyone else said for transit for for building the community um, is is just um, not an option, I, I believe, um, in, in this community with, without someone giving something back to, to benefit it. So um, I, I, I would make sure, um, you know, we, when doing it, that it's fair and it's equitable um, and it's not displacing or, or if we're developing here in the ward, if I'm elected, that we're not doing any harm to, to the residents that's already here. So I, I, I do believe that if we're giving breaks such such as tax abatements, we need to get something for it, so. Thanks a lot, Eric. Um, we have another question in the, in the, the chat um, and um, this will go, Kate, you'll start this one up. Um, uh, it's on this subject of community benefit agreements. They've been focused on short-term construction projects. Um, and there's now discussion about um, uh, public subsidy for the baseball stadium. And uh, the question is whether you would support um, uh, uh, some sort of an arrangement with the, the, the baseball team and the baseball field. And what should uh, the community benefit uh, agreement be in return for that kind of support? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I think I need some more education about the particulars of this deal that's coming up for the baseball stadium, but I will say that in the past, I have been hesitant for the city to continue to spend large dollars on these stadiums when it seems like we've been, um, you know, sold a bill of goods over and over again about, um, about what the economic benefit is going to be of these stadiums, and I don't think we've necessarily seen a return on that investment. So. I would have some caution about 
about supporting that. Um, and I also think in the past, the, the community benefits that have been promised, like with the Q deal, um, were not followed through on in the way that they, that they should have necessarily been. So um, I definitely think we need to be more thoughtful about if, if we're gonna continue to get into these deals um, with our sports stadiums, that we are, uh, th that there's some accountability built into the system about how we collect on that community benefit. Um, like for example, the, the GCC agreement with the Q deal was to, um, was to have some mental health uh, facilities and um, I, I don't think the community is getting uh, what we bargained for out of that deal. Thanks, Kate. Eric, you're up next. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a little leery of, of community benefit agreements with stadiums and baseball fields and teams and things of that nature. And it, it hasn't benefited um, uh, the people. Um, we're, we continue to fund and to support um, millionaires and billionaires um, in these endeavors and we get nothing back for, for, for what, what should be given to our citizens. You know, we, during COVID, we, during the city council meeting, they really went and allowed um, the, the gun, I, I, I hope I'm not misquoting, but the gun, um, uh, not the gun, but the first, the owner of the first, first state, uh, first energy stadium to really, they really bailed them out because their mortgage was coming coming due and they asked City Hall to to increase it. And so even during COVID, we 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 allowed them to do that. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm very leery about about giving breaks um, to to these organizations. They, you know, you're gonna have to prove to me that 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 the people um, are going to benefit greatly out of these deals. So I'm I'm ten seconds. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very leery of, of these types of deals, I'm very. Thank you. Ayat, you're up next. Um, it's really great being in a discussion with um, Kate and Eric, because I feel like we agree on many issues and they've um, taken a lot of the words already out of my mouth. Um, one of the things I would just like to say is often what we don't talk about enough when we make these deals with stadiums and such entities is what we're giving up in the process. Um, I've been a member of Clevelanders for Public Transit for many years, advocating for more funding for public transit. Transit is one of the best ways to cost effective ways for also poverty reduction. If you can get more people to have um, access to jobs through public transit, um, so, sometimes when we talk about poverty reduction in um, economic development, we're so focused on job creation, but not actual access to those jobs. Um, and um, in previous instances, public transit lost out in funding to, um, for, because we gave that funding and sent to uh, the stadiums. So I completely agree that I, I think more often than not, we don't get what we bargain for, and that a lot of times we can get more of a community benefit if we invest that funding in other places. Thanks, Ayat. Um, uh, the, the next question I'd like to pose is about the city budget. Uh, between 50 and 60% of the city budget is, um, uh, is for public safety. And there have been calls across the country uh, about the use of these funds. Um, what, um, how would you see uh, redistributing or would you see redistributing uh, the funds for public safety uh, in the budget? Um, Eric, you're up first for that question. Thank you, Pat, for that question. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I think we need to redistribute those funds. Um, some ideas that um, I think that we need for, for public safety is um, we need to figure out how to, to do it in a manner that's not harming our citizens. And what I mean by that is, do we, do we use um, the funds to hire social workers, to, to hire um, violence interrupters, 
interrupters. Do we use it? We have um, um, the Cleveland Peace Alliance, that is an organization within our right within our city. Could they be used to 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 go out and 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 lend a hand to to um, public safety? So uh, you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not in 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 compliance with um, hiring um, more police. I, I just don't believe that hiring more police is going to de deter crime. But I do believe um, taking those funds and hiring, hiring professionals to um, work alongside the police to, to, help, to help them fight crime would be idea. And so those are some of the things that, that I think we should use the money for. Ayat. Yeah, absolutely. So I said a little bit earlier how um, sometimes we na naively think that more funding for police equals better public safety, and that's not always um, a, a right analysis. Um, I think when it comes to reforming police, I look at it from three angles. Um, the first is um, even within the police department, they're, they have trouble recruiting and keeping um, keeping their existing members on the force, right? Um, and there's a diversity uh, problem in the police force. So I think even within the police force, there's lots of rooms for improvement um, that could have uh, racial benefits for our city. Um, the second is we have to look at alternative modes of policing. Um, Eric just mentioned a couple, community policing um, comes up a lot, um, uh, non-armed mental health first responders, for example. Um, a lot of these solutions other cities are trying, and for this I really look towards community advocates and what a community wants to, um, and are advocating for to make themselves safe. Um, and I think the third thing is we really need to look at the root cause of crime and really make sure um, that we're also addressing and allocating um, equally as much funding to addressing the root causes of crime so that it happens less often. We're not just reactive to the problem of crime, but we're also working to address. So um, this, this would involve, you know, making sure that we're um, funding. Okay, thanks, Ayat. Um, Kate, you're up next on this question of uh, the budget. Thank you for the question. Yeah, you know, Pat, I think um, to your point, a large chunk of the budget goes to public safety. Well, that public safety budget already is inclusive of other things that are um, that address community safety besides just police, right? Like that, that includes EMS, that includes fire. Um, and so I think of public safety as a holistic issue that we need to resolve in the city. And so if, if some of that public safety funding goes toward um, things like unarmed code enforcers, that takes something off of the plate of police officers that um, from police officers I've talked to in my ward, they don't, they're not really interested in doing that work anyway. And, um, and we could hire some more folks, pay a living wage to go out and do code enforcement in a way that is non-confrontational, that, um, that is less dangerous. Um, so that's one thing that, that I would look at is, um, is having code enforcement not be handled by police officers the way that it sometimes currently is. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in is, um, is a, a co-responder model where um, there are social service professionals who can go with police or respond to, um, to mental health related calls. One of the things I saw when I was working with people experiencing homelessness was, um, you know, police responding in a way to folks in mental health crisis that was really not helpful and actually escalated the situation. And I think um, that we could increase safety in the city and also increase access to mental health treatment for folks if we have that sort of co-responder model. Thanks, Kate. Um, you know, our last question is going to stay on the same theme. Um, it's uh, in the past five years, the Cleveland Division of Police hasn't made satisfactory progress towards the consent decree satisf satisfaction. Um, what would be your ideas about getting the Cleveland police and other police agencies in compliance with the consent decree and constitutional policing? Uh, I'm sorry, I need to call it somebody here. I think Ayat, you're next up first for that question. 
Bishop, you're hitting us with the hard questions, huh? Um, I think that's a very good question. And um, in regards to, I think, um, honestly, sometimes our politicians are a little bit um, too soft in terms of accountability and transparency into the process. Um, and this, I would also bring up Citizens for a Safer Cleveland and what they've been advocating for on keeping um, a civilian um, review board as a permanent function. I think having more civilian oversight and accountability into the process um, is a great way to introduce more police accountability um, from a and also um, potentially also build trust between residents because um, they now have more of a, a way to voice um, uh, oversight on police. Thanks. Uh, Kate, you're next on this one. Yeah. Um, oops, sorry. Um, in addition to some of the things Ayat said, I, I am supportive of the Citizens for a Safer Cleveland ballot initiative. I do think that, that Cleveland needs to be very committed to, um, to resolving these issues because not only have we lost lives in Cleveland as a result of um, negligent or, or bad policing, um, we've also lost money. This is, a, this is a, a problem for the city of Cleveland's budget to have to pay um, when, when there are these lawsuits. And so it, it's really important and it's also gonna take a lot of hard work and um, relationship building and trust building with police and with communities. And it's really challenging, but um, I'm committed to doing that on city council to um, getting more residents involved in, um, in these kinds of tough conversations with police officers. Okay. And Eric, your thoughts on this subject? One of the things that we've seen in um, trying to um, get Cleveland police to comply with the dissent decree and th uh, their reluctance to it is that the police um, has a union and a contract and we have to um, deal with those issues with the police and, and the police union and, and finding a way that we could work with them to get these things that, that, that's in the dissent decree um, in compliance and into their contract. And you know, I've had a couple of interviews with some mayoral candidates and this is one question that I asked and how do we work with Cleveland police and the police union to, to, to get some of these things because that's, that's the entire holdup. Um, we already have a commission that has, has um, for the last, I want to say past five years, have been trying to deal with this unsuccessfully. And the reason is because the police um, union is, 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 is blocking their efforts. So I, I, I do believe we, we've got to find a way to work with the police union to, 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 to adhere to what the dissent decree um, outlines. Thank, thanks, Eric. Uh, we're going to squeeze in one more question here. Um, a question on the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Um, and uh, the, the, the questioner asks to share your views on one of three things, one or, or more. Um, uh, public school funding, the return to school board democracy, uh, and charter schools. Um, if you want to talk about all three, have at it. But um, if you want to do one of those, that'd be probably, uh, probably a more sane thing to think about. Anyway, Ayat, I think you're up first on this question. Um, yes. So uh, when it comes to schools, public schools in Cleveland, I think one of the things we don't talk enough about, about how school vouchers for charter schools is hurting our public school system. Um, and often we're not always getting, it's more expensive um, on a cost per student basis than um, funding public schools outright. Um, and I think um, we really have to look at um, prioritizing funding for our public schools instead of um, searching for um, private model, private school models um, as an alternative. Thanks. Um, Kate, you're ne up next on this one. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think one of the really challenging things about this is that um, 
so much of this policy that impacts us as a city is, uh, is handled at the state house. And that's where I think it is really important for us as Cleveland City Council to work with our local school district to advocate for policies that serve the city better um, and to work with other statewide advocates. I think we are going to see some improvements in this new state budget as it as it comes to the way that funding for schools is allocated around the state that it'll be less reliant on property taxes and, and we should see some more funding in Cleveland. Um, but that's a temporary provision. It, it's only in, in for two years. And I think um, we need to be start advocating now to make sure that those reforms stay in place and also think about other ways to make sure that the way that the state of Ohio funds schools is more equitable. Um, and from my role in city council, I will be uh, working with our partners at, at the state house to try to get that done. Thanks, Kate. Eric, you get the last word on this. Thanks, Pat. Um, I was just having this conversation with my brother today about um, schools and funding. And I think Ayat and Kate um, made some great points. But one thing we've got to do is we've got to find a way to get the school board members to be elected officials. They've got to be. Right now, we've, have, we've had a mayor in the city of Cleveland for 16 years. And the mayor is responsible for appointing those school board members um, 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 to the school board. They may be his friends, they may be his cronies, they may be someone who's ineffective, but you know they're not answering to the citizens of Cleveland. And I think that we need to have um, those positions just in other cities, just like in other cities, where the school board members are beholden to the citizens that elect them. And of course, we have to put term limits on it. So people, so people who, if we are electing them, that they're not on there for, for decades and decades and decades. Progress gets stifled. We see um, um, uh, uh, things not, not moving forward. And that's just, you know, how do we do that? But that's just one of my initiatives is to see how do we get um, the school board members um, elected. Okay. Well, th thank you all very much for, um, um, for, for participating tonight and, uh, and all these questions. Um, I want each of you to have a minute and a half to, to, to say something more about your campaign and, 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 and how people might join your campaign if they're interested in it. Ayat, you can go first. Um, yes, I wanna thank you all for showing up again um, on this evening. Um, so to join my campaign um, and to follow my campaign, um, my website is ayatforclee3.com. I'm sure Pat will be sending it out afterwards, but I can also put it in the chat. Um, and every week I'm having a fun event to just to get to know me and to also get to know um, other people in the ward. This Saturday at 10 a.m., um, if you come by the Carnegie West Library, you can um, get a free pot, a free, free plant um, from me. Actually, we'll be potting them together. Um, and if you're in the neighborhood, just stop by. We'll be utilizing the seed library from the, from the library, the public library. Um, in addition, I'll be having events like that every Saturday, um, which you can find about on my Instagram, on my website and such. Um, but I hope you will come to one of those events with me. My last ask, if I still have time, is um, if any of you are willing to host a meet and greet for any of us as candidates, which is just inviting a couple of your neighbors to your backyard and having us come get to know you better, that would be wildly beneficial. And I can put my email in the chat or phone number to help organize one of those things. Thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ayat. Uh, Kate, you're up next. Thanks everyone for coming. I, um, I'm really struck by how many of you also put in work over the past year to help shape the uh, policy objectives of this group and how much it has helped inform um, 
my thinking and some of my ideas around this. So I'm grateful to those of you who have done that already. Um, I would say if you're excited about my campaign, I would invite you to come walk with me in Old Brooklyn. I uh, would love to have you while I'm door knocking. Um, you can get in touch and I can share a link where you can sign up to do that. Um, my website is katewarrencle.com and all of my social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter is that website slash katewarrencle. Um, so get in touch with me anyway on, on my website or, or via social media and I would love to, I would love to have you here in Old Brooklyn. Thanks, Kate. And Eric, you get to go last here. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming and showing up. And so I am excited and I'm passionate about this run. And if you are too, and you think that the views that I have and the ideas that I have um, are something that you're in line with, you can um, visit my website at www. Cleveland, the number four, walker.com, and go there. You can um, read um, my bio. You can read some of the ideas that I have. And um, I'm trying to, right now, plan an event on July 25th at Luke Easter um, Park, where I'm calling it Walk with Walker. Um, we'll come out and have, um, and just kind of walk around the track, get some exercise. Um, there about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, I'll be providing Gatorade and cold water. Um, I'm going to try to get um, some, some uh, registration forms if you need to register and, and things of that nature. I will um, be canvassing very soon. I'm mapping out those routes. So if, again, if you're, you're in line with, with me and my ideas, um, Ward 4 has a crowded field. <laughs> Um, with many different people and many different ideas, but if you think that I would be um, a good representative to represent work for, please come and join me. Okay. Well, uh, thanks to everybody. I want to re uh, echo what uh, J Joseph Ryder said. Uh, thanks for everybody coming tonight for the candidates' time, and um, and uh, a, a better Cleveland for all. Thanks you for your participation. Uh, check out our website at uh, uh, abcforall.com, um, and um, actually that's not quite right, but uh, <laughs> you, you'll find it if you Google it. Um, and um, uh, I, and then if if you're interested in hearing the other three candidates, uh, they'll be on Saturday morning on Zoom. Uh, you can find that on Facebook as well, and they're they're representing um, wards. Um, Eight, twelve, and I'm block on and seven. Um, so, um, so uh, thanks, thanks very much for your your time tonight, and um, I'll look forward to a, a good campaign. Good night. <laughs>